everybody. <laughs> it's just going to be me for now. Angela will join in a few minutes. <clears throat> Um, so before I start reading, I just want to say a few words of thanks. Um, I want to thank Housing Works for hosting this event. Um, I want to thank Ray Wolf and A Public Space for publishing this book. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, it's kind of like the arm, like the apocalypse outside. Um, so I wouldn't have been surprised if I walked in and no one was here. So it really means a lot to me that you all are here. It's nice to see so many familiar faces um, from various parts of my life. Um, it's kind of strange to see you all in the same room, but um, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and of course, I want to thank Angela Florinoy for, for being here and being in conversation with me. So I'm not going to read for very long. Um, I'm just going to give you a taste of the book. I'm going to read from the second story in the collection, um, which is called Juve, 1996. <coughs> I'm just going to read the first few pages. Juve, 1996. All I wanted was 15 bucks to go to the barber shop but the thought of asking for it made me feel like punching a wall. It stressed me the hell out to ask Ma for anything, especially that summer when I decided to leave my boyhood behind. Pop would have known just what to say to calm me down or make me laugh. He wasn't around anymore though, and he'd stopped responding to my letters. So I went to our room to gather myself and practice my appeal. But of course, my little brother was there, too bizarre to ignore. Omari still had on his stupid rubber mask, a caricature of a great horned owl. A candy cigarette poked out at an angle from under its mottled beak. He was sitting at our desk, his butt swallowing the chair, and the clock radio played that boring white people music he liked. The oscillating fan rattled as it blew his newspaper clippings across the floor. Our room was strewn with these sheets of taped together headlines. As he paged through a neighbor's discarded daily news, a few caught my eye. Homeless youth under house arrest. Death named country's top killer. One armed boy applauds kindness of strangers. Together, they formed a patchwork calendar of the world's absurdity. A pathetic cloud of chalky smoke made of powdered sugar fell from the tip of Omari's cigarette. He'd found something he liked, a small but representative peculiarity. After testing his scissors on the air, he slowly snipped out a headline, making a show of it. September's the weirdest month, he said. The cigarette bobbed up and down under the beak as he spoke. September just started, dummy. I can already tell. He rose and stretched. At 11, he was nearly as tall as I was and as broad, and broad like Pop, his body an unchiseled slab. The ear tufts of his mask were sharp enough to scratch you. He squeezed between the fan and our bunk bed and went to the window. Though the kitchen was on the other side of the apartment, we could hear sink water speeding through the pipes. We lived on the second floor of our building, not even high enough to see the top of the tree outside. Leaves from a bough pressed against the window. In a month, the view would be pretty. The panes tessellated in autumn shades, but it wasn't so nice now. When I was younger, Right when Pop stopped coming around, I had nightmares about that tree, breaking through the glass and reaching inside to grab me with its branches. I invited somebody over today, Omari sang. He gestured toward the window frame. Apparently, 
his newest imaginary friend was there. Her name's Angela. <laughs> Who cares, I said. Omari turned his face toward me, twisting his neck as far as it would go. He unwrapped the paper from the cigarette and bent the hard gum until it broke. Reaching under the beak, which curved from the bridge of his nose, he slipped the pieces into his mouth. The black and amber eyes of his mask were large and round. But the freaky thing was Omari's eyes within those eyes. They stared directly at me now, two pennies sunk in a bucket. Where we lived, it didn't matter what a room was called. Ma would wash her hair in the kitchen, careful when she was done rinsing not to hit her head on the bottom of the cabinet. Sometimes she'd take phone calls in the bathroom or go in there to listen to the radio. When she was sick of me fighting with Omari, she'd take her dinner plate into her bedroom and go out to eat in peace on the fire escape. Now she was in the kitchen washing dishes. She used scalding hot water and never wore rubber gloves. Her hands were tough, long, and deeply lined. She was tough, with wiry, muscular arms. But this afternoon, as she cleaned, she also concealed the woman I knew by making herself look soft. Pink plastic rollers filled her hair. The smell of dabbed on Florida water rose from her skin. Mike, her new boyfriend, was coming over. Our dish rack rested on top of the refrigerator. There was no other place for it. And she handed me clean plates to stack there as I made my case. She leaned against the wall, seemingly exhausted, her long slip spotted with spray from the faucet. Money's tight, she said. You know that, Ty. I told you to get a job this summer, but you hard-headed. A lazy boy does things twice. She shoved a fistful of wet utensils at my chest, but I just looked at them. I wanted to get my haircut at the place Pop used to go. I was 17 and had never been to a barber shop. Homegrown afros and cornrows all my life. Maybe I wouldn't know what to say once I got there. Maybe I'd ask for the wrong thing or laugh at the wrong time, surrounded by all those clever men grooming each other's masculinity. Still, even if I embarrassed myself, I felt ready. I was almost a grown-up, not a boy. Plus, tomorrow was the West Indian Day Parade. This was the first time she was letting me go by myself. If you're not going to help, she said, get out the way and quit breathing all over me. Now we both stared at the forks and knives clutched in her hand. Ma, I need to look good. She shut off the water jammed the utensils in the rack and sidestepped by me. Been doing this boy's hair all his life, she muttered. I'll just cut it my damn self. She started banging around in the closet where we kept photo albums, boxes of discount toilet paper, and Pops' old winter coats. Next thing I knew, I was sitting in the living room with my shoulders draped in a towel. Here was the woman I knew, a force of nature, and I was totally helpless against her. Maybe, just maybe, some invisible force would steady Ma's hand. But who was I kidding? I had probably just stumbled again into that stagnant puddle of mud, belief. It was silly to think good things could possibly happen. But I had no choice. I described the style I wanted, picturing it as I spoke. A skin fade like Pops's, with the taper smooth and balanced, perfectly even, all the way around, a timeless look. Ma wasn't even listening. She fumbled with the box, which had a white person cheesing on front, pr proud of his bowl cut. Are you sure you don't want one of those high tops? She hovered a hand several inches above her head. That looks easy enough to do. I began to fidget in the chair and made one more attempt. All the guys from school go to the barber shop, I told her. Tripp's been going since before he could walk. Like I give a damn about some fool calls himself Trip, Ma said. Trip. Trip ain't in this family. Trip ain't got to make the sacrifices we do. 
sacrifices. That's right. For, you, for your brother and for you too. Don't you mean Mike? The heat rose quickly on my ear after she hit me, my cheeks stinging from her still moist hand. Though she yelled plenty at me, almost never at Omari, Ma rarely hit. Before she could scold me or hit me again, the intercom rang. Ma made her voice all sweet to call Omari and tell him to buzz Mike up. Then she started on my hair. Soon Mike walked in with a bottle of bright pink wine and his dopey grin. Ma got dopey in response and apologized for her appearance. Always look good to me, babe, Mike said. He kissed her on the cheek and plopped down on the couch, the coffee table sandwiched tightly between us. Omari sat, too, exactly where Pop used to relax with a beer and watch TV. You keep nicking me, I said. Ma was being rough with the clippers. Well, stop talking. Your whole head moves when you talk. I'm not the retard here. What did I tell you about saying retard? Mike grinned extra big as he took in the show. Ruth, he said, you truly a woman of many talents. Ma nicked me again when she laughed and the clippers barked at every botched contact with my scalp. When she stood apart to take in her progress, they hummed in her hand. Mike said, boy looks like he could be on TV. Right, Birdman? Omari's eyes shifted within the owls. He was smiling. Though shy around Mike, he didn't seem to mind him. This pissed me off, even though he was too young to remember when there had been a real man around. When Mike offered to add some finishing touches, I hopped up and hair rained from my shoulders. I rushed to the mirror by the front door. I couldn't believe what I saw. On top, a tall, crumbling brick of hair, edged by a jagged line, a sharp, wandering border. There was no fade, no taper at all. My mouth got tight, ready to curse loud and long. But Ma gave me a look that stopped me in my tracks. She said she wanted me to take Omari out for a while. For what, I said, because of him? Mike spread his arms, a gesture that meant, don't you dare talk to your mother that way, at the same time that it said, hey kid, just leave me the hell out of it. You got a problem with that, Ty, Ma said. I'm not the one bringing in problems. Do you pay the rent here? Do you pay any of the bills? I'm a grown woman and I work my ass off. I'll be damned if I can't have a friend over. Omari sang, everybody needs to have a friend. But I told him to shut up. I need to take another shower, Ma said wearily. By the time I'm done, I want you boys out enjoying the day. Well, can we at least get some money, I asked. Ma went to the window and switched on the hulking air conditioner we rarely used. Be back in time to set the dinner table. Six o'clock, sharp. You'll be all right till then. When she shut herself in the bathroom, Mike flipped something at me, a quarter. In case you think about coming back early, he said, eyeing his bottle of wine. Go on and give us a call first. It was a hot, breezeless day, the air gauzy and wet. Though the sun was high in the sky, a lone and distant object, its energy came from everywhere at once. I wandered around the neighborhood, tugging down the bill of my Nick's cap. Omari trailed behind. Families walked from afternoon church service, sweating in their dress clothes. Fathers unbuttoned dark jackets from their paunches and slid down the knots of ties. One man with a bushy soul patch under his lip shouted for his little girl to stop running as she neared a corner. The weather was similar when I'd gone to the West Indian Day Parade with Pop. This was before he went away, when I was seven and Omari was a baby. I heard Pop come in early Labor Day morning and get ambushed. Ma was yelling because he had stayed out all night. They argued like crazy and woke Omari 
Then Pop came into my room, bleary-eyed, and told me to get ready. When we left, Ma was still screaming, and Omari was crying in her arms. The parade was heat and laughter, flags and floats, music so loud I felt it was shaking me more and more awake. I had my first taste of jerk pork there. I even got to pick the exact pieces I wanted from the vendor's smoking grill. After we ate, Pop lifted me to see over the crowd on Eastern Parkway. The women dancing in the procession were nearly naked, but plumed, with sprays of brilliant multicolored feathers. When I shifted my eyes away from their bodies, Pop laughed and told me it was okay to look. Mike's quarter felt warm and dirty in my shorts pocket. I was tempted to pitch it into a gutter. Omari lagged behind me, walking with one foot on the sidewalk and the other in the street. I was melting in my cap, and here he was with that mask. He'd been wearing it since Mike began coming around. All of a sudden, Ma had started acting girlish, humiliating herself. She even smiled in a ridiculous way, like she did in her pictures from high school. You could see all her teeth and held like a tiny bud between them the bright red tip of her tongue. She crossed and uncrossed her legs with extreme awareness of herself, awareness that Mike enjoyed looking at her, delighted that he did, as if she were some other woman and not our mother. Thank you. So I, um, I gathered by um, the amount of applause that Jamal received just by walking in the door <laughs> that he has a lot of fans and friends here. So I'm going to make sure there is time uh, for ample audience discussion and questions um, as well as the questions that I have. Um, but first, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so when did I meet you? I met you, was it at Breadloaf? Oh, was it at Breadloaf? Was it, it was either at Breadloaf or in Iowa City. Okay, yeah. maybe it was in Iowa City. Um, I assume you were working, so if it was at Breadloaf, it was in 2015. If it was in Iowa City, it was maybe, it was 2015 also. Mm -hmm. I assume you were working on these stories then. I was, yeah. Um, so talk to us about uh, the genesis of the collection, how long you've been working on it, and all of those things. Um, the, the first draft of the oldest story in the collection is from 2012. Um, so six years from first draft book. Um, and you know, I, at that point, I didn't think I was writing a book. Um, I was just trying to write one story. Um, I was teaching high school English at the time and had very little time to for my own writing. So here in New York? Here in New York, okay. yeah. And, um, you know, on an occasional weekend and over seasonal breaks, I would just try to squeeze in time to write something. And then in the summer of 2012, I went to about 500 writing workshops um, and sort of peddled this, <laughs> this one story around. Um, and I got a lot of support from, from my peers and instructors that summer and, and you know, long story short, ended up going uh, to get my MFA in Iowa City. Um, so I arrived there with two stories. So um, two of the nine stories were done by the time I got to Iowa in 2013, and then I spent the next um, three years writing and revising the rest of the stories. And what was the first story? The first story um, was Infinite Happiness. Um, so you came to Iowa with infinite happiness and... And no more than a bubble. No more than a bubble. Which is the opening story, yeah. Those are both pretty long. So yeah. I, I think you probably came with like more than the average amount of pages than yeah. most people who come to Iowa. I came, I think, with like 30 pages to my name and oh. life. <laughs> yeah. Pretended that there was like this yeah. massive other uh, fiction that I had written, but it, it wasn't. It didn't exist. Yeah. Um, so when did the the stories, um, I'm very interested in kind of 
like how one puts a collection together, how um, you think about kind of like sequencing and also like kind of thematic cohesion or coherence if mm -hmm. it if it exists if you desire for it to exist how do you how did you kind of um conceptualize all of that yeah you know what I, I mean i didn't think about the sequencing at all until the book had already been um sold so as i worked on the stories i was kind of just working on one story at a time you know i kind of would you know put my blinders on and just sort of you know work on the next thing um so I wasn't consciously writing with a thematic focus, but obviously there, there are thematic focuses in this book. Um, and I just sort of chalked that up to, you know, whatever obsessions I had um, unconsciously. And, you know, so like I said, I was sort of working on one story, you know, then the next story, then the next story. As far as I was concerned, when I was at my MFA, I was sort of learning how to write, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I wasn't like, oh, I'm writing a book here. <laughs> Um, and it took others to convince me that what I actually was doing was writing a book. Um, but, you know, you're asking about putting a collection together and, and, you know, after the collection was sold and we were going through, I was going through edits with my editors, um, of course, a lot of the focus was on the sentence level, scenes, you know, stuff like that. But maybe the most interesting part of it was thinking about the sequence, the order. Mm -hmm. um, and what a specific order might communicate to a reader. Um, at one of my previous events, someone asked, you know, do you want people to read it from beginning to end, or is it fine if you just jump around? Um, you can do what you want. Um, but I, I do think that what we settled on was an order that was deliberate, and I feel like, or my hope is that if you read the collection from the beginning to the end, it takes you on a certain journey. Um, so, as I warned you, I'm going to just sort of randomly ask you about to talk about a book throughout our conversation. Um, talk about a book that you love or that um, maybe you don't love, um, but you found yourself reading a lot when you were working on these stories for four yeah. or three years. Yeah, um, I will talk about a book I love. And one, one collection that I sort of read and reread over and over again um, while I worked on this was Lost in the City. Uh, by Edward P. Jones. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, th I guess there are some, some resonances. I feel like this book is in the shadow of that book. Um, his book is focused on um, black folks in Washington, D.C., um, and my book is obviously focused on, on African Americans in, in New York, specifically the Bronx and Brooklyn. Um, but more than that focus and place, um, I think what I really love about that book and love about him is just how much he seems to love all of his characters. Um, and I really do mean that word love. Um, you know, empathy is a word that gets kind of thrown around a lot these days. But with him, I think, I think it's like generosity or, or love or something else. It just feels, there's a warmth, in other words, you know, that, that he has for his characters, no matter who they are. You know, one of the stories is about someone who's a terrible person, Caesar Matthews, um, who, you know, does terrible things. Um, and, you know, the story is basically about him planning to rob what he calls a retarded woman. Um, but you can still feel that the, the narrative intelligence is so warm towards him, so under understanding towards him, which always kind of astonishes me. So that's a book that I kind of read and reread and um, had aspirations toward as I worked on my own. Um, it's funny that you would say that you are in the shadow of that book. I would wager that you might be holding, your book might be holding hands <laughs> with that book. Um, I, was, I was thinking about um, both Lost in the City and all Aunt Hager's Children, which mm -hmm. if you haven't read Edward P. Jones's uh, short fiction, you should. Um, yeah. For many reasons, but for one, um, well, there's like the sort of obvious, it's, um, you bring up Caesar. I was thinking when I was reading um, about Curtis, remind me the name of that story. Um, um, a family. A family, yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking about Caesar and the way um, Curtis just keeps calling Lena a bitch. <laughs> and, and that's it. And then it's, it, it just keeps happening. But yeah. it, you're sort of, um, just, you're just in C Curtis's brain. And so it doesn't, 
it doesn't require the story. I think sometimes, especially in workshop, people were like, the story has to punish a person who does a thing. Yeah. And it's like, life punishes people and sometimes doesn't punish people right. who do a thing. Um, and Caesar, who's in both collections, um, mm -hmm. is punished and not punished and punished for things that are not perhaps the right things. Yeah. Um, but in another way, sort of in a craft way, the, um, uh, I could see how Edward P. Jones is sort of um, kind of in this book is um, one of the reasons why I'm really interested in Edward P. Jones as a person who is um, intimidated by short stories is because he figures out a way to do the thing that intimidates me with short stories, which is I don't have enough time to talk about these characters the, as, for as long as I want to. Mm -hmm. He figures out how to get like a novel worth of characterization yeah. in 25 pages. Yeah. Um, and so every story feels like it's not, it's not doing sometimes what I call like tricky character math that short stories do, mm -hmm. which is like I have to figure out Forgive me if I'm getting too like nerdy right now, but um, I have to figure out like the right kind of touchstone so you feel like you know a person, but I don't have time for you to actually like spend time with this character. Yeah. I have to kind of gloss over it. Right. But he's able to do both things, which is to keep something brief, but also make it feel very deep. And I think that um, you accomplish that very well in your stories. Oh, thank you. Um, which leads me um, to my next question, which is also sort of related to um, Jones thematically, is. Another thing that struck me about this collection um, is the kind of level of kind of like granular interest and um, kind of care that you take with just ordinary black folks. Mm -hmm. um, just getting a bad haircut by your mom, you know, in the <laughs> yeah. kitchen, um, as one does. Um, I've been a giver of many bad haircuts, which has happened. <laughs> What happens when you make people move to Iowa City? They get oh, bad you haircut. gave haircuts at Iowa? Yeah, we're not together anymore. I think it's because I was given in bad faith <laughs> in Iowa City. Anyway. Yeah, that would do it. All for the best. <laughs> all for the best. Um, but, um, so, I don't know. It, it's one of these things, it's almost like it's a dumb question. But it's something that I think about, um, probably because I'm asked a lot about, like, ooh, why is it important to you to just write about like regular, not rich, sort of traumatic in the way that like existence is traumatic, but not like homing in just on these moments of trauma like black people? Um, I don't know what the question is exactly, except um, I don't know. High five for doing it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, you can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think. Um, you know, when I think about the characters in this book, I feel like I feel like in a lot of ways they, they just reflect the kind of people that that I've known, that I've grown up with, um, who are fascinating people. You know, um, so I, I kind of just wanted to. My, my goal was to do justice to just you know the quote unquote everyday black person, um, and you know the stories don't have to be about anything super heroic or super traumatic. You know, there's somewhere in between, you know, sort of the small victories and the small tragedies that, that make up everyone's lives. So, you know, um, I, I feel like the book is populated by the kinds of people that I've known and people that I've um, admired for, for various reasons. Um, and maybe that's, that's kind of one thing that draws me to the short story. You know, there's this idea that, that novels you don't have to be because your novel isn't like this. But a lot, you know, traditionally the novel is sort of about the hero. You know, that's the sort of the traditional idea of the novel, whereas the short story so it can sort of be about you know the little person, the small person, the everyday person, um, the person around the way. And I'm kind of drawn to that because I think I think people's stories are fascinating. I have lots of friends in this room. I know your stories, and they're fascinating. You know, so of course you can write about people. Um, like the people in this room. Um, that doesn't seem strange to me at all. Um, so another thing that kind of uh, struck me was the role or kind of recurring um, like presence of dancing mm -hmm. in the story. There's um, the story that's about like capoeira in particular, but yeah. there's so many stories where um, dancing and particularly trying to figure out how to connect bodies mm -hmm. um, plays a central role 
and um, I wanted you to maybe talk about dancing and then maybe talk a little bit about like, the music you like and how that influences you when you're writing or thinking about scenes. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think about the dance and the music in the book um, together. And, you know, I, I didn't write the stories intently. You know, I'm going to put dance in all these stories. But, you know, obviously it's important to me um, for, for various reasons. Um, but, you know, bro more broadly speaking, I think that, that dance and music are two of the, you know, most vital and recognizable expressions of, of black pleasure and joy. Um, and I feel like if I was going to write these stories and, you know, cast an unflinching eye on these characters in their lives and sort of, you know, not turn away from the ugly parts and, you know, be honest about ugly feelings or ugly things that people may think or say, then, you know, it can't just be that. It can't just be, you know, um, you know, uh, like black trauma porn, you know, it, it has to it has to be a balanced look at people's lives. So I just feel like, you know, to get the joy in there, even if it's just everyday joy, you know, um, listening to music at home or dancing at a club, whatever it may be, I felt like it was important to get that in there, um, just as it was important to get music in there. So I have hip hop references in there, I have blues references in there. Um, both of which are important musical forms for me. So it was just important for me to, to, to write, if I was gonna write everyday black people, I feel like you have to write black pleasure and joy. That's just part of it. Um, and you're sort of able to take a moment where someone gets broken off, it's not a dance floor, it's <laughs> the street, um, as kind of the climax to a story, that moment where Ty and um, Juveg like gets broken off by this woman. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is this the climax of this story? It kind of feels, it's like right around that moment. I was like, I don't think I've ever read. Um, yeah, she backed it up and he really couldn't take it. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I've ever read um, yeah. this as like a climactic moment in a story. But it, it is like, it is. Yeah, um, especially would be for a teenage boy. Right, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I, I was in there for two seconds. Yeah. I was right. in there for two seconds. Yeah. Um, uh, which is uh, amazing. Another book. Mm. Um, another book that comes to mind that is important to me and that I try to reread every year or two is Corregidora by Gail Jones. Um, it's a very slim novel. It's called a blues novel, or you know, scholars refer to it as a blues novel. Um, Gail Jones is an amazing writer and a very interesting person. Um, but the reason that book, one of the reasons that book stands out to me um, is uh, it goes along with something we were just talking about. So the role of music in that mm -hmm. book is, is huge. Um, the other reason is dialogue. Um, there's a lot of dialogue in there. And the dialogue has to do a lot of work in that book. So it's, it's sort of a, a great book to study if you want to improve your dialogue and to show how a narrative can be carried and how, how much can be conveyed about characters between two characters um, with just dialogue. So Corregidor by, by Gail Jones, a great one. So do you have a personal, or you, have you sort of developed a personal kind of philosophy um, when it comes to dialogue, particularly sort of like code switching or people's relationship to language. Um, when you're thinking about a character, do you make that decision kind of consciously? Like this person never drops a G on a gerund. This person, mm. um, I don't know, like is, a, is a, a frequent user of habitual B. Do you think about that or? Yeah, I think, mm, I kind of think about it just in terms of sound. Mm -hmm. I, have this, I have this idea, which might be total BS, but I have this idea that that every character, and maybe every person has their own rhythm and sound. Um, and part of what I try to do with my characters is try to capture that sound. Um, so when I'm drafting, when I'm revising, editing, you know, if, if a character doesn't feel right to me often, it's because the, the sound is wrong. Um, the words are coming out incorrectly. Um, they're using the wrong words. The rhythm is off. Um, but I, I do think that, that characters have their own rhythm and that story, the story rhythm is sort of running counter to a character's rhythm a lot of times and that's where the conflict comes from. Um, I just kind of, I don't know, I don't know if I have a fully fleshed out theory. 
um, I just think a lot about sound. What does it sound like? What does it sound like? And think less about um, the expressed meaning, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of the way it's rendered on the page, I guess I kind of follow, maybe follow, try to follow James Baldwin's example. You know, like he, doesn't, he doesn't drop G's, but you hear it when mm-hmm. you're supposed to hear it, you know, on the page. So it's, it's something just about the way that he writes his sentences you know that that G is dropped. You right. know, he doesn't have to put it on the page. You just you just hear it because of the sentence that he wrote. Right, the sort of syntactically, it kind of points yeah, to exactly. what it should sound like. Yeah. Um, which is interesting, because then in, in some stories, they kind of stand out because of the way that the characters are like much more clipped than in like the story surrounding them. So for, insta- for, in- for, in- for instance, in Everything the Mouth Eats, mm-hmm. um, the uh, it's Carlos and Eric, they have like very sort of short kind of staccato ways that they talk to each other. Yeah. And the person in the middle who's sort of more fluid is, uh, how do you say her name? Sulai. Sula. And, but both of them are, almost all of their sentences are either declarative or really um, confrontational questions <laughs> <laughs> to each other. Yeah. Um, but what it sort of builds is this sort of like story of like shared kind of secret and trauma. Yeah. And no one wants to talk about the thing. So it becomes so hard to actually even have like a back and forth, like rapport with one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in, in that story, you know, the, the way that they speak to each other, especially early on in the story, is, is certainly about what you said. And it's mm-hmm. also about the fact that. You know, these are these are two brothers who are learning, relearning how to speak to each other. They just don't know how to do it, and there's a lot of misunderstanding, um, aggression. You know, there's there's a lot of problematic history between them. Um, so that's the way they speak to each other. You know, in the beginning of the story, they're not even directly speaking to each other. So they, you know, they're they're speaking, like you said, through an intermediary. So my hope is that. You know, as the, as the story moved towards its ending, that the language, their language with each other, starts to change a little bit. Because I don't think that they've, you know, had some amazing breakthrough by the end of the story, but I, I do think they're trying in a way that they hadn't in the beginning. So maybe my goal was to have the way that they speak to each other feel less clipped and less confrontational at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, another book. Another book. Um, let's see. Uh, another book I'll name is um, Gold Boy, Emerald Girl um, by Yoon Lee. It's a short story collection. Um, and she's a, been a teacher of mine. Um, I love that book, and I reread it constantly. I just think that she has like an ingenious, it's like a scarily ingenious understanding of human beings. <laughs> um, and she sort of writes these stories that are almost unbearably sad, but you have to read them. You know, they're not so sad that you just want to stop and throw the book against a wall. Um, they're sad in a way that like sits in your gut and, and makes you feel more human. Um, and one of the stories in my collection is, is trying to, I'm glad she's not here, but um, one of the stories in my collection is trying to, to talk to the title story of that collection, Which actually. One? Um, a Family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I have to reread it. Um, I love Ian so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I don't have anything else to say besides that. Um, one of the things that I think um, very sort of early when I was um, in my MFA program, I started reading kind of was introduced to Ian Lee and started reading. Um, and then I convinced myself that like, I don't know how to write a short story. <laughs> Basically by reading Ian Lee and like the, it seems kind of like perfectly constructed. She, but she has done interviews about how in her earlier um, collection, she did actually kind of employ a kind of math. Like this sort of plot thing has to happen by oh, this page. She doesn't do that anymore, Okay, but she used to. and. Um, that made me feel better because I was like, yeah. okay, it's not just in my mind that there's this unknowable short story math. Right. There actually it is, is. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> in the case of her. Yeah. But um, one of the things that um, I'm sure you're probably asked a lot about is like kind of what masculinity, um, like what role it plays in the collection, 
particularly for me, um, a personal sort of uh, fixation for me is men who age and are alone, <laughs> whether they are literally alone or just emotionally alone. Yeah. And it seems like it's either a reality for characters in your collection or a constant fear. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted you to kind of talk about um, talk about it. Yeah, I think, I mean, this might be a sideways, of, of coming, sideways way of coming at your question, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, again, when I was writing each story, I wasn't thinking, this is a story about masculinity. But, it, you know, obviously, it, you know, they came out that way. And I just think, so for example, I think about the, the journey of, of the kind of masculinity I've seen from when I was a child to when I became an adult, you know. When you're a boy in school, I feel like there, there are very narrow <laughs> notions of masculinity. And you're expected to follow them. And if you don't, then you're probably going to be an outcast, right? Um, so for instance, probably the most accepted form of touch between boys in early on in school is like fighting, <laughs> you know, like hitting. Um, and anything else, you know, it's like, mm, I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, I experienced that and in other ways that, you know, being a boy felt prescribed. Um, but then, you know, you grow older and you go to college and, you know, you graduate from college and you meet, you know, other friends and, and a different kind of, different possibilities for masculinity emerge. So again, I have friends in this room who, you know, we hug each other, you know? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a strange thing for us to, to be intimate in those ways, right? Um, so, so I'm thinking about that journey. And to, to circle back to your question, I think that, that maybe people who are worried, maybe men who are worried about being alone or who do end up alone um, haven't fully embraced that experience that journey, like maybe they still feel stuck to, mm -hmm. to certain notions about what it means to be a man. Um, and, and if life frustrates that version, then they can't do anything else, right? Or they don't want to do anything else. Um, so, so maybe the ways in which you, you, um, you press against or struggle against, you know, dominant notions of masculinity d can determine what your community is like, whether you'll be alone or whether you'll be with other people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I think that's right. I think um, some the characters also one of the things that I I felt kind of that I don't know if I'd ever seen it ex kind of explored in in so many different um, like angles is the way that if you are a person who doesn't have sort of like an awareness of like self in your own kind of like emotional landscape, how expressions of desire can be really perplexing mm. even when you're performing them and you know that you're sort of performing in the way you're supposed to yeah. what you're actually thinking about can become like not right. associated with it and yeah. throughout um throughout the collection there's these moments where um the men think that things are going to go one way <laughs> and yeah. they actually go another way right. and they don't really have the tools to figure out why that happened yeah um which in some in some cases is really amazing and and funny, um, like in no more than a bubble. <laughs> and I I kind of wish we had seen like sort of you know pixel by pixel <laughs> the entire um, non orgiastic <laughs> encounter. <laughs> yeah. But um, but in other ways, so then that way it's kind of funny um, because they got the thing they wanted, but they it's sort of perplexing. Um, like why? How did we get here? But then. Um, in the case of in a family, how you how you can keep saying yes to a thing and you end up living with a person, <laughs> yeah, and yet <laughs> kind of, right. um, I thought that was really well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think you know, I'm sure we've all been in this situation before where you're you're kind of doing the expected thing, you're following the script, even if it doesn't jibe with your <laughs> internal compass. You know, it's like, well, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, so I'm gonna do it. 
even though I feel some kind of way about it, or no, I'm supposed to embrace this, but you don't really want to embrace it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a feeling that we all can identify with, whether it's about you know your gender identity or something else, but it, it just feels like a, a, a very human thing that we all have to grapple with. Um, that's exactly what I was going to say. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Is there a microphone that people need to use? Yes. Yes. Hey. Good. How are you? Um, so the question, if, if I can distill it, um, is about if uh, Jamel's consciously writing uh, about a particular kind of generational masculinity, like a early 90s sort of post certain conversations about masculinity story. Yeah, I, thanks for that question. Um, I think, you know, I didn't go in thinking about that. Um, it probably was more just the fact that I was writing what I knew. Um, but I totally get your question, and you know, having thought about masculinity and having you know studied masculinity in in college and in grad school, obviously some of that stuff must have must have seeped in. Um, but I didn't think that you know this is a particularly '90s version of the story. Um, but that but that seems that seems true, especially you know if we if we really go to the um, to the historical context, like one of the important reasons for me why that story is set in when it is in 96 is because it's after the Clinton crime bill, right? So when, when um, Ty is talking about my father's gone away, it's, it's a result of, of that bill, right? Which was, which treated, you know, low level drug users, you know, in this really harshly punitive way. Right, so I, I kind of wanted to write into that context in particular. So maybe that sort of speaks to to some of what you're saying. Like, what you know, what does it look like after this legislation is passed, and the way that it you know affect thousands of lives, right, um, and affected households, and and you know, of course, probably you know on a smaller level, on a on a household level, just affected the way people thought about family or fatherhood or masculinity. The question is about um, using your own experiences or the experiences of people you know in your fiction, and um, basically, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so when I, when I said earlier that, you know, I have friends in here and I know your stories, I didn't mean that I'm stealing your stories. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, in, in these stories, I certainly pulled from my own life. Um, and I got permission from myself to do that. <laughs> um, but in terms of in terms of you know pulling from people I know, it's not so much their experiences. It might it might be, um, you know, a, a kind of person. You know, like they you know these I, I know these kind of people or this kind of personality trait. So it's not sensitive information. 
about their lives. Um, or the other thing you know, that I might do is to, is to pull from experiences that we share together. So if I'm, you know, the first story is about you know, a house party in Brooklyn, which is pulling from a communal experience that I had with my friends, you know, um, or Juve, like going to Juve with friends, um, that kind of thing. So it's more, it's more like if I'm, if I'm pulling from experiences, it's either my own experience or a shared experience um, that isn't really about sensitive information. Um, and, as, and if it's about, you know, individuals, then it's like, you know, this person makes me think about something, but I'm not, I'm not trying to like take from their lives. Another question? So did the process of writing the book um, answer a question for Jamel, or what question was sort of left open after completing the book? Um, I think, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, what I would say is I feel like each story individually in the collection uh, caused me to ask certain questions. And I'm not sure if any of them provided answers, honestly. Um, the question just sort of led me into the next phase of writing the story, you know? Um, so, for example, uh, the last story in the collection uh, is called Clifton's Place, and... Which is Tip Top, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's based on a bar in Brooklyn called the Tip Top Bar. Um, maybe some of you have been there. And, you know, I've, I've been there a couple of times, but it just struck me, it just stayed with me. You know, and I hadn't been there in years, but that place just, just stayed with me. So, you know, my question was, well, what is it, what is it so, what's so interesting about this place to you? Um, so I made up my own version of it, and then I just started asking small questions to help me write the story. So, whose bar is this, right? And it turns out that it belongs to this woman, Sadie, right? Well, how did she acquire, what's the history of her and the bar? So then, you know, I kind of write that into the story. Um, and then we get into some, you know, contextual stuff. You know, where is the bar set? What's happening in the community, you know, where this bar is set? So, so that just sort of leads me bit by bit through the story. Um, I don't think that, that I was asking any large questions, which may be a disappointing answer. Um, someone else at another event asked me, you know, said, you know, this, this collection feels really timely because we're talking about me too, we're talking about toxic masculinity and that kind of stuff, so you were writing into that, weren't you? And I'm like, no, I started this collection six years ago. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that this moment would be this moment, you know? Um, so really, I, I just think that, that questions are my way of composing the story, discovering what the story is. And at the end, all I feel like I've done is, is told a story. I don't think I've answered any questions for myself necessarily. I've just sort of maybe led to new questions, which is great for a writer, you know, to have new questions because it gives me more stuff to write about. Time for two more. Yes. Um, so the question is about the um, the story, a lucky man, and um, how it came to be, basically. Yeah. So, um, without giving it away, so so there's a there's a there's a racist incident in the story, um, and I started there actually because I'd heard about a similar situation. Um, but the process of writing the story was kind of to write away from that incident. Um, one of the things that, that um, Ian Lee says mm -hmm. is that you know, when, you have, when you have something that's really dramatic in a story, something large, a huge cataclysm or you know, a big racist incident, a car crash, it tends to um, flatten the character. 
you just sort of become the person that that thing happened to, right? Um, and you know, the, the unfortunate thing about racist incidents is that you know, you're sort of the victim of racism, right? But no, like you're, you're a person, you have your own life, you have all your other stuff going on. So, so my way of writing that story was to start with that kernel of the incident and just sort of write away from it and just figure out who this guy was and what else was going on in his life and how this incident might have affected him other than you know, the general, that was racist. You know, what, the, what are the specific ways in which something like that might have affected a man? Um, so it was really just sort of taking, you know, a, a really problematic incident, but sort of moving away from it and making the story kind of less and less about that as I went on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Last question. There's no pressure at all. <laughs> everybody's favorite question. <laughs> um, now that you're done with this thing that took so much time, <laughs> um, what are you going to do next, Jamel Brinkley? Yeah, um, thanks for that. It's one of my buddies asking that question. <laughs> um, I think, well, one thing, I've, asked, I've answered this question before, and so one thing I like to emphasize is that, you know, there's an unfortunate thing that happens in the publishing world where a short story collection is perceived as a stepping stone to get to the novel, right? You, so you write some stories and you're like, okay, I'm done with that. Now I'm gonna do the real work and write a novel. And, and I, I wanna resist that as much as possible. Um, so my hope, you know, as long as I'm writing, I hope to be writing stories. Um, I don't know what, they're going to be about. I mean, I've started a couple, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I want to continue writing stories for sure. Um, but I also do, I'm going to have it both ways, I also do have an, have an idea for um, a longer narrative, um, which I think is probably going to be a pretty short novel. Um, so I want to work on both, more fiction, basically. Um, I also have an interest in essays, but don't ask me about that. Um, all right. Um, thank you all. Jamel is going to be signing books over there. Um, congratulations. Thanks, Angela.